And we're on. Jed Johnson, thanks for being on Fitness and Consciousness. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Looking forward to it for a while now. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, me too, for sure. Um, so you're known mainly for grip strength. and You have uh, a hell of a, a grip. And you have you've done some things that nobody else has done in that, in that world. And, um, so like what made you get started? What, like what about grip what was so appealing to you that you made that your thing? Yeah. So it really comes down to in 2002, I was, I was really active on a, on a website forum online called drsquat.com. And at some point in 2002, there was a guy that was very active on that forum talking about grip training, tearing cards, um, closing grippers, and doing different feats of strength with things like plates, um, you know, five, uh, five, 10 pound plate pinches, mm. 245s, plate pinches, things along those lines. And I just enjoyed reading his post. He was very passionate about it. His name is Rick Walker. And as it turns out, I'm from Pennsylvania and he's from Pennsylvania. And uh, we, we messaged a little bit and I didn't, it didn't really take off for me right away. I didn't, I wasn't super interested in, in learning all of the grip, the different grip feats, but tearing a deck of cards seemed like it would be a cool party trick, something to do at the bar, you know, get people talking, things like that. So I, I first started practicing just tearing a deck of cards and uh, from there, uh, I think then I, I learned about the gripper certifications that are out there and I started training for gripper certifications, closing big grippers. And it just kind of grew from there. That guy, Rick ended up holding a grip contest in August of 2003. And I signed up for that. He was just right down the road, about three hours away in, in Pennsylvania at, in Punxsutawney. So I signed up for that and ended up doing pretty, pretty well. I was doing strongman competitions at that time, and I figured, you know, it's important to have a strong grip for strongman, so I thought the two sports would complement each other pretty well. So I went ahead and focused on grip in addition to the strongman stuff, and I continued doing both until 2006, but I started having pretty significant back injuries in 2006 and I, I really I was, I was getting hurt a lot at the competitions I was tweaking my back in in training a lot so I finally just had to I had to shut the strongman stuff down I'll still do some stone lifting every once in a while and I like working with the strongman log doing overhead press and things like that but I don't do much more for strongman competition style training it's it's mainly grip and just uh your basic strength and muscle building right now yeah what about the strongman do you think was was hurting your back was it the whole accumulation of things or was it like particular techniques that you think were messing with you so i think like uh um i don't know why i can't think of it when they just put the big the heavy uh bar on their back and then just walk and they'll have like a thousand pounds um yoke yoke, yoke carry yeah because yeah. um, i think like that's that's probably not so good for your for your spine health and yeah it, like what for you do you think was causing the injuries the main the main thing for me was the fact that i actually hurt my back the first time ever in ninth grade in gym class there was a, there was a game that we played called Greeny Weenie. And basically what that was is a, uh, we would get into the wrestling room, all the boys, and then we would split off into two teams. And the gym teacher would take this giant green towel, throw it out in the center, and then call our numbers. So uh, on each team, there was like a, a one and a one, a two and a two, three and a three, et cetera. And he might say three and eight, and then three and eight would go out from each team. They'd fight over the towel and try to bring it back to their base at the other end of the wrestling room. Well, it was all fine and dandy until I had to – he had me go against like two dudes one time. 
So I'm fighting over this towel. And at some point I got into an awkward position throughout my left uh, SI joint. Mm. So my whole life since then, even in baseball in high school and basketball in high school, I've dealt with this SI joint problem. So when I got into strongman, you th- throw on the fact that I was starting with a pre-existing injury and then the fact that I would uh, – I, I think my technique was good most of the time. There were some things that I was probably lacking on, but I think the fact that I was constantly going balls to the walls – Um, I never did any deloading or anything like that. And like you said, you know, doing, doing things too often and never giving yourself a break, like yoke walk. I don't think the yoke walk itself ever hurt me. I think doing it too frequently is what got me. There was a contest where we had to do a chain yoke. So instead of the yoke being a fixed implement and steel and not, you know, rather rigid okay instead of being rigid the the the, the vertical portion that would normally be a still was pain. so as i picked it up one time it really started to shake on me and started to swing and i tweaked my back really really bad on that so that was if i remember correctly that was the beginning of 2006 or possibly the end of 2005 and i was training for a competition in march I believe of 2006. So that, that really spelled the beginning of the end because I, I never really bounced back fully from that. And then I did one more competition. I want to, it was in the summer of, of uh, 2006 and it was just, I just had to call it quits after that. I just couldn't do it anymore. So uh, that's, that's really what it, what it amounted to these days. I still have to be aware of it. So it's still kind of an issue for me, but it's not, it's not as bad of a hindrance as it used to be. So I would have like interruptions in my training for sometimes two weeks where I couldn't do what I, what I needed to. And uh, I used to have a job in an office and I would like be hobbling around like the hunchback of Notre Dame because of my back injury. But uh, these days it's not nearly as bad. Thank God. Yeah, because with the grip stuff, you're lifting relatively light weights compared to whatever you're doing on the yoke yoke walk you're you're not pinch gripping that so yeah a lot less a lot easier on the entire body i would yeah probably the heaviest you know the heaviest thing i've done in the last few years is just the double overhand axle lift and i'm i'm under 400 pounds there so that's not really a test for my back mm-hmm. um there have been some things where you might do a farmer pick or uh Uh, a frame lift or something like that. So those are a little bit heavier if the handle stays small, but I mean, those are few and far between. So I have, I still have pretty decent strength. I can double overhand deadlift probably now 450, but I've done 525 in the last few years. Mm -hmm. So I still have pretty good strength, but it's, I got to just be really, really careful and listen to it these days in order to avoid any issues. Yeah, when um, something I was wanting to ask you about is how how the grip training affects the rest of it. So you're like, it doesn't sound like you're really caring too much about your deadlift. You're, I mean, it, it's still there. You still, you know, like the um, axle lift and, uh, but how does just training the grip or focusing so much on the grip help with the the bigger lifts like the the deadlift? Um, is like, like, it, like just being able to have the tight grip helps you keep everything tight or how did, what's the transfer that you, that you see from it? Yeah. I mean, I've never, I've honestly, um, since starting grip training, I've never dropped a deadlift because of my grip failing. I hear about that all the time, but I've, I've never actually had it happen in, in my training. Not even, I mean, honestly, not even back in the day do I remember dropping anything because of my grip. Um, so yeah, by doing grip training, by doing grip sport training like I do for competition, your hands get stronger and, and it will carry over to the deadlift. But normally for the deadlift, if you're going to train to improve the grip that you're taking on the deadlift so that you're not dropping deadlifts, you would need to do like specialized training for that. So it, would, it, it's, it wouldn't even really help that much to do axle work for 
um, to bring up just your normal deadlift, you would want to work mainly on um, the bar that you would be using in competition, most likely. Uh, but yeah, um, you know, I continue to lift heavy when I can. Uh, so in October of 2016, I, I, I probably had my worst back injury from lifting ever. And I was actually out of lifting for about a month. So I've been extremely cautious ever since then. I just put deadlifts back in uh, this spring and I was immediately up to 450 and that's, that's double overhand. So the strength interest is still there. I also injured both my knees this year. My daughter jumped on my knees and injured both of them. So I haven't squatted in a while. So I have, I have some lingering injuries, but the, you know, there's always an interest in building strength. The, the stronger your, your body gets, the, the better potential you have for grip strength. And the stronger your hands get, the better potential you'll have for uh, bringing up all your other lifts. Because when your hands are stronger, you can hold on to more weight. You can hold on to it longer. You can do more repetitions with the weight. So even things like curls and rows will go up. Pull-up performance will go up. And I'd even say that, um, you know, pressing movements, bench press, um, overhead lifting, all that stuff will go up too because when you increase those, you when you increase your grip and then go to those, you're, you're more stable, your wrist is stronger, and you're able to have better command over the, over the bar. Um, and then even squats, I'm sure, you know, any, any level of confidence that you can, you can improve upon in your, in your squat is going to help you out. So if you don't worry at all about where that bar is going because you can keep it right in the, the spot you want it to on your back, that's going to that's gonna probably lead to improved uh, confidence and better performance on the squat. So really, you know, I think it's Mark Bell that says strength is never a weakness. And if your grip is a limiting factor, then you need to bring that up. So grip is something that everybody should at least be focused on as far as maintaining a, the proper level of hand strength for whatever lifts they need to do or sports they play, et cetera. Yeah, I was, uh, I was wondering because my, my, my jiu-jitsu teacher would say something like he's like, there's no, there's no gap between your hand and your, and your brain. So like if you're uh, grappling with somebody, you, you can like feel which way they're going and it's like this immediate thing that you can react to. But I was thinking like towards for like lifting, if you can, uh, like you're, uh, instead of like putting straps on, so we can all lift more with, with using straps, but maybe we shouldn't use straps because our, our hands will say, this isn't safe anymore for the whole body. It's not just like, yeah, my, my fingers are weak, so I can't hold on. It's, it's more than that. It's like this whole thing that, that, that's lifting the weight of my whole body, it's not safe to do this. And my hands are like the first thing to say, we need to shut the operation down. We're not picking this thing up or we have to let go right now. Do you like um, believe that or do you think that's it's just like do you think that the the grip will fail to save the rest of the body? Yeah, does that make sense to you or um I honest I I actually don't agree with that. I do agree that I do agree that there's a tremendous uh, connection between the brain and the hands. In fact, um, I don't have the reference for you, but there's actually it's like a sculpture out there that kind of uh, it kind of shows how much neural connection and activity there is between parts of your body and your brain. And um, so basically it's got like a normal size. If you look at the head, yeah, that, that's kind of normal size, but then the hands are like five times, five times larger than the head because there's so much, there's so much nervous tissue that's in there. Um, in that peripheral nervous system that uh, it really dwarfs the amount that's in so many other parts of your body. So I agree with that. But um, I actually feel that straps and, and other grip aids have their place in training because, yeah, you don't want to have a weakness in your grip. But at the same time, um, my back, I mean, I have no grip issues, but my back um, – can handle way more weight than my hands can. So if I want to do like a, a rack pull, 
or some kind of a rack lockout and hold or something like that, um, you know, I can pull way more weight off the rack with my back strength than I can what my hands can handle. So if I'm looking to just bring up my back strength using a rack pull in order to perform better on uh, maybe say, uh, let's say my arms are all torn up from lifting stones and I can't, I don't have, I can't go out there and train stones and I can just load my back real heavy with some rack pulls and some wrist straps. I don't see a problem with that. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't wrap for every single deadlift that you do in the gym because that's kind of like, uh, that's kind of like putting a band aid over a muscle pull. That's not really doing anything for you of benefit. But if, uh, if your supplementary lift for your deadlift is rack pulls and, um, you know, if you can deadlift 500 pounds, but you can rack pull 700, then let's throw some straps on there and see if we can do some rack pulls with like 715. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, don't, I wouldn't ever tell someone to hold back the development of the rest of their body just to, um, avoid the use of straps. Yeah. I was, uh, wondering cause there was like, I didn't use straps for a, a long time and then I was doing some rack pulls and the numbers are fun cause we're piling on weights and it's, it's easy to, you know, keep, keep adding. And it was like when I started using the straps though, like I felt like maybe I wasn't keeping, um, like my lats and everything is t- as tight or maybe like I couldn't, uh, like we're from a half and like grip it more, which of course you're gripping with the straps too. But like the straps like made me, it, it, or at least I felt maybe it was just cause I was going so much heavier than uh, without, but it felt like I was maybe like losing tension and making it not mm-hmm. safe, which made me kind of wonder, well, maybe if my hands are saying, this is a bad idea. We're not going to lift this weight cause we're, we're smarter than, than you are we're going to uh, shut this down. But like I was doing, like I've done like real like short range, just like maybe four inches or so, like six Oh seven with the, the rack alternate grip. And, uh, right. and it's like, it's real tempting to like want to go back to the, the straps. And I, I didn't really, I don't have a lot of experience with the straps. So I was just kind of wondering, um, like, do you feel like the tension, do you have like any trouble keeping, uh, Staying tight when you're using straps, or is it not not an issue if you practice enough? I think no. I right there, what you just said, I think is a, is the most important thing. I think I think tension management is a skill. Okay, being able to turn on tension when you need to, shutting it off when you need to, and maintaining it for the duration of the time that you need it—that's all a skill, and that's something that a lot of people don't realize. So if you, if you hook up with straps on a rack pull, then you've got a, it's, it's really a different lift. You're not deadlifting it. You're doing a, you're doing a rack pull. So you've got to make sure that everything's locked in there tight. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think the, the, the hands are saying that it's unsafe. I really don't. I think what you got to do is you got to approach that in a way where you've, you, you go through a different checklist in that operation. So your the, the checklist for a deadlift is probably a sequence of maybe five cues that you've got to go over in order to perform that exercise safely. Well, it's going to be similar, but it's probably going to be a little bit different when you lock up for a rack pull because it's coming from a different height and your angles are going to be different. So it's, it's probably just a matter of practicing that movement and getting better at it and getting used to the, um, the, the subtle differences that are taking place. So, uh, you know, I, I, I can think back to a time probably late, late last year where I was uh, regular, regularly doing rack pulls. And when I videotaped them, I noticed that I, my angles were all off and I didn't have tension in my lats either. So, cause it was feeling really uncomfortable on my back and it didn't make any sense why. So I think I had just gotten into a bad habit because if I do like a rack hold with an axle, an axle is about two inches in diameter. So it doesn't test my back because the weight drops so much. If I go a lot heavier, 
Well, I had done the axle for so long that I didn't need to generate all that tension because the loads weren't the same. So I got in a bad habit of kind of half-assing my, my tension for the axle rack pulls and holds. Mm-hmm. And then when I went back to the barbell, I, I just had bad habits. So I, once I saw that in the video, I was able to correct that right away. Um, you know, maybe a, a public service announcement would be to be cautious about, I would be cautious about doing overloading rack pulls with an alternated grip because if, if things go wrong with an alternated grip, it's very risky on the bicep and you can actually tear your bicep tendon, um, in the, in the supinated arm. So I don't, I don't do any of that anymore. I haven't done, I, I do not do any supinated, uh, deadlift positions at all. I'd rather go double overhand on a deadlift, um, or even try a hook grip or just, or just use, I don't use straps. I use a product that's called Versa grips. And, uh, instead of, instead of it being a strap that goes on your wrist and then you wrap around the bar a bunch of times, it's just, it attaches to your wrist and then it's a leather piece that goes around the bar one time. So your fingers go over the Versa grip pad and then it locks in instantly. There's no slipping. It's, it's fantastic. And I've had these Versa grips since the late nineties when I first, uh, first started training. So probably I'd say 98, 99. Uh, is when I got those, and I still use them to this day. My lifters that come to my gym use them when they need to, um, because you know, on a lift like uh, Romanian deadlift, you know, you don't want to sacrifice the development of your posterior chain just because you can't hold onto the bar. So just this morning, actually, my guys were having a hard time performing eight reps with their required weight. So I said, well, grab those, grab those Versa grips, throw them on. And they were able to knock them out very easily. And next time we do those, we'll, we'll go at, we'll go up and wait. So, uh, yeah, just some thoughts along those lines. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll have to look into those. Cause I like the wraps are kind of, I mean, they, they work of course, but there was something about them that I just didn't, that I just didn't like, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's a different thing. It's, it's different. It takes a little bit, uh, getting used to. Um, you know, they also make, uh, they make hooks, lifting hooks, and you could try those. Maybe that would feel a little bit better for you. I've only used those maybe one time in my life. Um, I think it was because I was at a commercial gym on the road. I was traveling and I didn't have my Versa grips. I, I really just like the Versa grips. Mm-hmm. They're the best. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to check those out. Cause it, I do like to lift the the heavier weights, it is fun to pile on the plates and uh, lift more. So um, I remembered what, when you did it and posted this the video, and then I just went back today um, looking into, like, some more things to talk to you about. Like when you uh, yeah. lifted the uh, double 45 Yorks. And yes. Like, yeah, the, we call those – in the grip community, we call those old school Yorks because they're, uh, they're also called deep dish Yorks. They're about twice as thick as the 45s that you see most of the times these days. And uh, to top that off, the inside ridge is very, very narrow. So to put those together, smooth sides out with the print facing in, and then grab them and pinch them off the ground, it's very, very hard because the, the second they shift just a little bit, they want to drop right out of your hand. So it's, it's tough enough to lift 245s. Most people will train for years and not be able to lift 245s with a, that, are, that are thinner and have a nice ridge on the inside where they line up and you, you have some forgiveness there. But there's not a lot of forgiveness with the old school Yorks. And, uh, yeah, in that video I lifted a pair in each hand and I was the first person to ever do that. Um, that's based on research from Richard Thorne soren.com or exercise company mm-hmm. um and he's really considered like the one of the fathers one of the founding fathers of grip training he was the first uh captain of crush so if you close the number three gripper under authentic conditions through the iron mind enterprises company you can get the title uh captain of crush and he was the first person ever to close the number three he was also the first person to um 
consider uh, lifting a, a broken half 100 pound York dumbbell and he called it the blob. He was the first person to train for that and actually pull it off. And then he was probably one of the first, or he was definitely one of the first, if not the first to lift um, a pair of old school Yorks off the ground. And, um, you know, I, I, for years I heard him talking about that feat, how he had never seen anyone do um, a pair of old school Yorks in each hand. Uh, in 2011, I went to the Sorenex uh, headquarters. There was a thing called Summer Strong that they held there. And there was a guy named Chad Woodall, extremely strong, probably one of the top three, if not the top grip guy in the United States. Um, and he tried probably 20 times to lift the old school Yorks and was never successful. He was able to get one pair in each hand separately, yeah. but he wasn't able to get both pairs at the same time. So, you know, after that, I started training it pretty hard. Um, I first was able to lift one pair of old school Yorks in like 2013. And I think that's the video you'll see if you go to my YouTube channel um, it's youtube.com slash Jed Johnson with two D's. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the, the featured video that's on my channel. Um, and that's the first time I actually lifted one pair to lockout. That was 20. If, if, if it was 2013, it basically took me another three years to pick up the, the other one at the same time. So it, it took me a long time. So I did that. I did that. I think in, March of 2016 and then Chad Woodall the guy I was talking about before that tried it before he went to Sornex like a month and a half later and not only did he pick them both up he picked two pairs up but he also farmers walked them in yeah. the same session so he totally blew my feet out of the water <laughs> but uh um yeah that's that's probably one of the feats I'm I'm most well known for is that one and uh it was one of the things that I work. I had to work the hardest for as well. Yeah, it's kind of funny how that works. Like you, nobody can run faster than a, a four-minute mile. Nobody can break that, and then somebody does it, and then oh, it can be done. And then uh, people, you know, it's not that big of a. I mean, it's still a big deal, but you know, it becomes more possible in, in people's minds. Yeah, yeah you being the, the first one is certainly it just kind of like opens the path for uh, someone to do for someone else to do it. Yeah. I'm, honestly, I'm sure Chad was strong enough to do it for several years. Um, I, he's sent me videos over the years where he's doing plates that are very similar to old school York plates, but they weren't actual old school York plates. It was really just a matter of time. I think until he crossed paths with those plates and he would have been able to, f to do that feat. So I think he probably could have done it years before I did it. Um, but just, just didn't encounter the, the two pairs. So Chad's, Chad's a great guy, great father. Um, and he's a fantastic grip athlete. So, um, I don't want to, I don't want to take anything away from him at all. If he ends up listening to this uh, video, because yeah, I'm sure he would take me easily, uh, in any competition that we were at together. Um, just so happens that he's kind of retired from grip competitions because he's a family man now, but he's still one strong son of a gun. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I think this, I mean, you get, you get pretty emotional in that video. You can tell that you worked um, really hard for that for a really long time that, and that it meant a lot. And I think a lot of people may not understand. Yeah, no doubt. Maybe, maybe they don't understand what they're looking at. And I mean, I'm, I'm into grip too, but I'm nowhere nowhere near what you're doing, um, not, not even close, but uh, yeah, it is kind of this thing you work so hard for something, like for me, like my strong first certification, it was like this impossible thing, and then, you know, you finally end up doing it, and it's like, okay, cool, now now what's next, and so um, speaking of uh, competitions, um, you said you have one coming up in a, a couple weeks, what, um, What's that about? Like, what uh, what kind of lifts will you be doing, and 
Like what, what does the grip competition look like? So, uh, yeah, the grip competition that I'm holding is July 21st. It's in Syracuse at the state fairgrounds and it's taking place right alongside a WAL arm wrestling tournament. Mm. And what we're going to do. So, so that's when it is. So if anybody's in that area, they should definitely check it out. It's uh, July 21st. Um, the way a grip competition works is you'll have generally at least three lifts and you try to do as well as you can on all three lifts. And then your over, overall score is based on how well you did in all three lifts. So in that regard, it's, it's very similar to a powerlifting meet or a strongman contest or, you know, probably many other types of sports that are out there. Um, the main thing is in grip is that whoever finishes first on that day gets a hundred points for that event. And then the score that each person gets or the weight that each person gets in that event is then divided by the number one, uh, score, the first place score. So they get a percentage score based off the best lift of the day for that event. So, um, if I, if I, let's say on, uh, on a pinch lift, maybe I get 120 pounds. Then if that's first place, then I'll get a hundred points. And then if someone else gets a hundred pounds, then that's a hundred divided by 120, which is, as we all know, is five divided by six. What's that? 85? I do it. I don't know. Like whatever it is, um, so you get whatever that mathematics ends up being. That's what that's what your score is. So um, the nice thing about grip is you are you are rewarded for kicking everyone's ass. Mm -hmm. So if you blow everybody else away in that event, you'll get a hundred points, and they'll get a small percentage of that. In in strongman. It's different. If you get first place, you get one point, and then second place gets two points, whether you beat them by 50 pounds or 500 pounds. Yeah. So, um, so I like grip scoring when it's people score from time to time, and it, it's a whole different ball game. But generally, grip is done on that base 10 or base 100 uh, scoring model. So, um. And then sometimes you might run into a grip contest with steel bending. These days, that's almost non-existent. Generally, steel bending is done completely separate as a different practice in sport altogether. It's far more common to have something like a wrist roller, where the wrist roller is fastened in a, in a cage or some kind of supporting device, and then it's got a cable or a strap or something like that attached to the wrist roller. And then at the end of the strap or, or cable, there's a sled and you would pull, you would turn the wrist roller in order to make the sled come to you. And you try to finish the course as quickly as possible. Um, also a lot of times there's a medley in a grip contest. Uh, medley is where you've got all kinds of different challenges that you have to try to either lift, close a gripper, bend a, a bar, maybe rip a phone book, but there's all these different challenges that are lined up and you have to try to complete as many as possible inside uh, the given time limit. So at the national championship this year, there were 12 items. There were multiple difficulties per item. You could, and you were, you would get points. Uh, you would get more points if you lifted the item that was heavier or more challenging. And you had 90 seconds to do that. Um, so a lot of grip contests also have medleys. So that, that's a cool thing about grip that you don't see in something like powerlifting. In powerlifting, it's the same three lifts all the time. And the only way it varies is if you change your weight class or if you go to an event that's raw instead of using um, the, the, the lifting equipment, the, the suits, the bench shirts and suits and things like that. So, um, but, but in general, there's three to five events at a grip contest and you want to do as well as you can in each one in order to get as good of a score as possible because your, your score at the end is based on how well you do in each event. 
And then in July on the 21st in Syracuse, what we're going to be doing is we're going to run four events. And the order is escaping me right now, but the four events are the Napalm's Nightmare, which is a double, a two-handed rolling handle implement. Then there's the, the shallow inch pinch, which looks like you're kind of uh, pinching on a matchbook or a harmonica in your, in your hand like this, something small. It's, it's, you can't really wrap your hand around it. You use a, a key pinch. Um, we're using uh, the inch wrench, which is another kind of rotating handle implement, but it's a little bit different, and it attacks the thumb, wrist, and fingers in a different way from the Napalm's Nightmare. Um, those three lifts, instead of using weights, what we're going to do is, is we're going to attach those implements to a crane scale, and then you're going to pull isometrically as hard as you can in order to get the best score that you can. Hmm. And whatever, whatever number uh, reads out on the display, that's the score, that you, that's the lift that you perform. Instead of carting up there all kinds of plates and having to weigh them and figure out what exactly they weigh or scare up calibrated plates, that's what we're going to do. So those are the first three events, Napalm's Nightmare, um, Shallow Inch Pinch, and the Inch Wrench. And if you help me remember, I'll, remind, I'll, I'll tell you exactly why it's called the Inch Wrench. So those are the first three events. And then the last event is a Pinch Block Hold for Time. So uh, I market an implement called the Pinch Block. And um, generally it's used for curling and strengthening the fingers and wrists just like a plate curl. But for this one, we're going to load weight onto it and we're going to pick it up and hold it for time. And you want to hold that thing as long as you can. So we'll start the clock the second that it, it leaves the ground and then your the time will stop once you drop it or set it back down. So those are the four events. And the reason the inch wrench is called, like it has that name, is because it's a training implement for lifting the inch dumbbell which is one of the famous challenge bells that used to it's it's it gets a lot of attention it's been strongman competitions for over but a 172 pound dumbbell with a handle that's two and three eighths inches thick so it's it's a handle that's about as big as a soda can attached to um a, a giant circus globe head dumbbell and it's all cast iron it's all one piece so when you try to lift this thing up the globes are even bigger than the handle so the globes start to rotate and it really rips your hand open so the inch dumbbell lift itself is a very very hard lift so the inch wrench is used to train for the inch dumbbell because there is a, a strap that goes out the circumference of the handle so the rotation that it creates is very very vicious so it's a good way to it's a good way to train to lift the inch dumbbell without actually having to buy an inch dumbbell because they're they're actually pretty expensive. They they cost four hundred and seventy five dollars. Mm -hmm. So and that's that's before shipping. Mm -hmm. Shipping can be a nightmare too, depending on on where you live. So mm -hmm. inch dumbbells are rare. The inch wrench makes it possible for you to train for them, uh, just using the implement and a loading pin and a stack of weights. So um, those are the four events. Um, like I said, we're going to use the crane scale. So you're just going to grab and go, grip it and rip it. And um, we'll be able to push people through the competition very quickly. So I would say for these four lifts, you can probably be, you can probably expect to be done in maybe under five minutes and um, maybe it would last until, you know, for 10 minutes, but you'd be able to go through the grip contest and then go and do something else. Watch the arm wrestling tournament. I don't know if there'll be other stuff going on. We've gone up there before where there was like, um, we've gone up during the state fair. We've gone up during, um, they had something called the man show, which is like car shows and bikini models and stuff like that. I didn't name it. So don't get mad at me. That's just what it was called. Um, so I don't know. There's going to be other stuff going on. What's cool about this contest is that you're going to be done in five to 10 minutes. Whereas in a normal grip competition, you're, you're locked in for a minimum of four hours, sometimes longer, mm -hmm. um, because they're, they're running a much different format 
and you get more attempts. You're basically only going to get one attempt uh, at this competition, but that's all you're going to need because you really don't you don't see much of an increase on a, on a crane scale pull. So there's no there's no getting a safe lift so that you're on the board and don't zero out like a normal grip competition. You're just gripping it and ripping it. So uh, that's how the contest is going to go. It's going to be interesting. It's the first time that a contest of this nature has been fully sanctioned by Grip Strength International. So this competition will qualify all of the winners in each weight class for the North American Grip Sport uh, Championship in 2019. So I'm really excited about it in that regard because it's the first time it's ever happened. It's uh, We're trying out something new, and I think it's a way to introduce more people to the sport and I, I, I think the possibility is there to end up having some, like, absolute monsters show up that we've never seen before, we've never heard before. And these people sometimes don't even know what grip is, and they just get their hands on the implements, and you see them picking up inch dumbbells and blobs. They don't normally pick up the old-school 45 York plate. But, um, you know, every once in a while you see somebody that is just really surprising and they're able to do some crazy stuff. So I'm expecting to see some of those people walk up and, and try their hand at it and do pretty darn well. So uh, we're going we're gonna to see what's what happens here in a couple weekends. Yeah, it sounds really cool. Good spot to do it, like arm wrestling competition that I would think a lot of those guys, so they could just – maybe they sign up for the arm wrestling competition. They, they don't know that you're – the grip competition's going on. Maybe they're they're like, oh, I want to try this out. They can just walk up and give it a shot. Is that yeah, it's uh, I I think it's just going to be five dollar entry fee in order to uh, to compete. So it's real easy. Normally in a grip contest, uh, you're looking at a minimum of twenty dollars to compete. Sometimes more. Um, so uh, it's it's not a big it's not a big investment in order to compete in this contest either. Yeah. Are there weight classes? Yeah. Yeah, there are. Um, the, let's see if I remember them. Um, I know that there's one in the fifties. I want to say it's 54 kilos. Um, and then there's also 66 kilos, 74, 83, 93, 105, 120 and then 120 plus that's for the men the the women's categories i honestly don't recall what all the weight classes are they're similar to the men's but not exactly the same like i believe there's two 50 kilos like a 53 and a 58 kilo maybe and then a 63 so i can't you can't go by my memory right now for the women's categories, but the, the men's categories have been around for a lot longer. We're always trying to get more women involved. Like every time that I do one of these types of competitions, I get women that, that take part. So that's awesome. Um, it's just that we haven't, we haven't had as many competitors at nationals. So I just haven't been able to uh, remember all the weight classes. But if you go to gripsport.org, and check out the top 100 list. You're able to search by weight class and uh, by uh, gender. So you'd be able to figure out what all those weight classes are that way. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, dude. Weight classes. There's no, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, just because you're heavier than somebody doesn't necessarily guarantee you're going to have a stronger grip. But when you're heavier than someone, chances are you've got a lot more muscle on your body. So um, in, in many cases, it is important to track the body weight. Now, there are – actually, the, the North American champion from 2017 was in the 83-kilo class. Hmm. The champion this year was from the 93-kilo class. In neither of those cases – was that person the heaviest person at the contest? In fact, um, we had several people that were um, 300 pounds plus in nationals this year alone. So um, it's 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 a factor. It's not a one to one correlation, but it is a factor. Um, I've always thought the the best way to go would be hand size, 
um, because with hand size, it, it, it makes such a big difference on thick bar implements. But, um, you know, the sport went a different direction with weight classes in 2011. And uh, I right now, I don't see any reason to change. Um, so, uh, yeah, we it's, it's going to be fair. You're going to be competing against people in your weight class. And that's why we're going to qualify one person from each weight class for nationals this year. Yeah, it sounds – Sounds really cool. Um, what was I going to ask you about? Yeah, um, this had something in my mind. And I, I forgot about it. Uh, oh, so if somebody was wanting to get into like grip, they're um, like the, if they start looking into you. There's pinch grip. There's thick handles. There's it, it can almost seem like overwhelming. Like if you first like look into grip, it's just like oh, I just want you to work on my grip, and then it's like there's a lot of different kinds of grip and hand strength. Sure. Things like where there's new you- stuff coming out all the time, new stuff coming out all the time, new implements. It's getting put into competitions. Um, they just introduced something called a finished ball over in uh, Finland. Not too, not too long ago. So there's, there's new stuff coming out all the time. Um, if you want to find out about grip, there's no the absolute best resource is my coaching site, the grip um, there's bottom line, there's, there's no better place to go for instruction on grip. Um, my YouTube channel has a tremendous amount of grip videos and I have a website, dieselcrew.com. There's all kinds of information there. Um, if you want a free resource, you can go to gripboard.com. The, and the, that's probably the, the longest running grip resource that's out there. Um, but if you're looking to get started on the fast track, come with me at thegripauthority.com. Sign up for a dollar for the first month, and, and you'll get an education and get get your uh, for, uh, best foot forward from the beginning. Um, other than that, there's not really a lot of resources out there. Mainly in the U.S., when it comes to grip information, I'm definitely the most plentiful provider of information. Uh, I sell. DVDs and things like that, eBooks on grip training and uh, developing your hand strength. So, um, if anybody has any questions, I'd welcome uh, emails or um, messages through Facebook, uh, Twitter. I mean, I don't use Twitter that much. YouTube. Um, I'm much more active on Facebook and Instagram than anything else. Or just email me through my website, DieselCrew.com, and I, I'll, I'll get you going in the right direction. Um, so yeah, but like you said, dude, it can be really overwhelming. There's new stuff coming out all the time, but but we'll we'll get you going down the right path for sure. Yes, yeah, it's definitely a good source. You're when people start looking into like how difficult the things are that you're you're actually doing. It's uh, yeah, it's really incredible. So um, I know you said you had some family stuff going on tonight, so I, I don't want to um, hold you up too much longer. Um, is there anything else that you're wanting to? Uh, talk about before I let you go? Um, mainly just that, you know, grip training isn't just about competing. Um, I, I do grip sport because I absolutely love it. I'm pretty darn good at it, but I, I love it anyway. Um, and, and performing the feats are, are very important to me also. But you don't have to train for grip sport or you don't have to train for different grip feats if you bring your hand strength up, it's going to be really beneficial for you. So if you do any kind of training at all, even, you know, Ninja warrior, obviously that's, that stuff is taking off big time. Well, that's like 75 to 90% grip strength and endurance. So if you do that, powerlifting, strong man, uh, you know, martial arts, like you said, um, grappling and wrestling and in all different sports where you use your hands, grip strength is very, very important. So you want to, you want to train your hands and get them strong because you're only strongest. You're, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So, uh, I would invite everybody to check out dieselcrew.com. That's my free website. My YouTube channel obviously is free. It's youtube.com slash Jed Johnson, uh, with two D's J E D D J O H N S O N. And then, uh, if you, if you really want to speed things up and hit big feats and close big grippers, then join me at the grip And that's, uh, that's pretty much it, man. And, uh, thanks for letting me talk about everything today and talk about that competition. 
And if anybody is in the Syracuse area and wants to compete that day, make sure to look me up and say that you uh, you heard about it on Ryan's show. Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks for coming on. Um, um, yeah, I'm I'm really impressed by by so much about so much of what you do. It, it's uh, it's cool to have you on and yeah, more thanks, about man. It. And I'd, I'd like to have you on again for sure. Um, so I guess we will uh, wrap it up. I know you got some uh, family stuff to get to. So yeah, I'll, that's why I'm in a car sweating my my balls off right now. Because <laughs> I've got a whole house full of people at the house right now. So. I didn't. I didn't think the recording would go too well, so I'm sitting in my car on the side of the road. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we'll get back headed now, and uh, it'll be a good time. But thank you again for having me on, big man. All right, appreciate it. I'm gonna uh, stop the recording, and then I'm gonna talk to you for just a second when we're when we're done. Perfect.